Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To this Sabbath rest day, which is a lesson for us in real rest, uh, a rest that is recreative, a rest that is active and alive. Our rest, the sleep that we get, is really not the same as the Lord's rest, that is to recreate us as well and to bring us closer unto God. You do hear these ascetics who have attained this ability to keep their heart praying even while asleep. And my heart remaineth awake, as it says in the Psalm of Solomon. I was pondering as we were standing here that overseas, many Orthodox are at least beginning to prepare for this, and probably some in far eastern Russia have started, perhaps Japan, some of our Orthodox in those countries have begun this process already of Pascha. Our friends in Serbia and Greece and Athos and places are getting very close to that time period of the night. There's an anticipation. Not only is what we just proclaimed now, we've really proclaimed the resurrection. We're wearing white. In the Greek tradition, they were wearing white to begin this morning and already had the apotaphials in the altar. Different emphases, both good, both holy. The Russians emphasizing that tension waiting for that coming out of the tomb. Both beautiful. But our Lord is active in his rest. In the tomb today, he is harrowing Hades. We said in the service last night that he was stalking Hades. The devil was wishing that he wasn't there. He comes with the bloodstained garment of vengeance. Why have we accepted him if you were to go home today and find the Gospel of Nicodemus, that you know, pseudepigraphal little writing, which we accept much of in our hymnody, you would see this great image of Christ pulling these people out of Hades and beating on those brass doors and then trembling as the Lord appeared. <clears throat> it's a wonderful story if you can get a chance to read it. It really is, that part of it at least is orthodox. And the Lord continues to be active. Not only what he did then, what he does now. We see in the scriptures today this wonderful readings. How the Lord brings the people of Nineveh to repentance. Jonah can't quite accept it, but he brings them to repentance. And he humbles Jonah in the process. The Lord works the same way, to call us constantly through trials and difficulties, as he was telling the people of Nineveh of, that we need to repent in his activity. The Lord sends his prophet Elijah to the widow of Zarephath, and heals her son by lying on him, much as the Lord lays upon us with his grace, in the presence of the mysteries and the teachings of the church, by the laying on the hands of the priests, by his abundant grace poured out throughout the world. He does so with Elisha and going to the Shunammite woman, the same thing. Pours out his grace upon the dead, trying to raise up our souls as well. He comes to Daniel in the furnace, not to Daniel, but the, he comes to the three children of the furnace. He comes to Daniel as well in the lion's den. But he comes to the children in the furnace. The angel of the Lord, that pre-incarnate word, appears. <clears throat> and in our furnace of this life and all the temptations and the trials, the Lord comes to us and proclaims his presence and pours dew upon us of his grace. The readings go on and on and on with beauty. and We could reflect on all of them. But then there's the reading of Moses and bringing the people through the Red Sea. That is to us in our spiritual life. The Lord makes his initial appearance to us, comes to us with some initial visitation of grace, and calls us to repentance. He brings us through the darkness of life in some place where we're having struggle or the place of not having knowledge of him, and brings us through to the other side and calls us to put Egypt in the past, the Egyptians that have tormented us. But then we go into that period of wandering, where we struggle to make this our own, to live the life. God gives us the grace, but he wants us to embrace it. I know, a, I remember a man one time years ago called me on the phone, he was trying to be funny, but he said, are you saved? The man was somebody you'd have to know. I said, yes, 2,000 years ago on the cross, but I have to embrace it. He's done it. He's done it. I said, well, good answer, but I can't go back on that one. So, uh, the Lord is doing these things for us. Elder Sophroni loved to use this image of 
of Moses and the people in the wilderness is the image of the spiritual life. That initial image of illumination when the, Moses comes to them and enlightens them and brings them across that period of the wilderness is that struggle to live the life, to find God, to make deification one's own theosis, to be partakers of the divine nature, and of course deification self being entering into the promised land. And the Lord calls us today in his activity. He never rests. On every side of the globe right now, he is working <coughs> actively for those who are ill, for those who don't know him, for those who claim to know him, for those who do know him, for the black, the white, the yellow, the angry, the happy, everybody. The Lord is working actively in their lives right now, saying, come to me. He's bursting bond, the bonds of Hades, breaking the shackles from our hands and our feet, and just simply saying, come follow me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. If we accept this, embrace the power of this day, it can change our lives. And forgive me for going on, but the story always comes to my mind this time of year, as you know I've told it before, but I love this story. If you haven't read it, please read it. It's short, you'll read it in a day. Posca transforms Wolfman Tom. Yes, it sounds like a 50 horrors film, but it's not. It's a story of a Russian man who was cast into prison in the 1800s Improperly. He didn't do anything. We find that out later in the story when he goes to confession. But the prison system, as you can imagine, in Russia in the 19th century was not quite so pleasant. Not that it's pleasant now, but it certainly was not pleasant there. And finally, he escaped from work one night. And he begins this tirade of killing for years. In the strangest times when people would be having celebrations, he would crush people's skulls with this blood rock instrument he had made. This went on and on. He was a wild man. That's why they called him Wolfman Tom. The way he looked at everything. And so this went on and on and on. And so one night, they, the story is much longer than this, but they go on Pascha, this family, they leave the child at home with the servants to take care of this child who wasn't able to go. And Wolfman Tom comes while the family's at Pascha. He's going to kill this child. Looking wild-eyed, he goes into the room he has his instrument ready to crush his skull, a horrible death. And the little boy picks up his red egg that he'd been given and says, Christos Voskresi, mister. He drops his instrument. He's in horror. He's shocked. He runs out of the place. His heart is melted because someone showed him the love of the resurrection. As Christ is showing us, and so, the next day, as they're having probably agape vespers, Wolfman Tom comes into this big Russian church and standing there, of course, everybody is horrified and moving away. They just know who this is. The tales have been going on for years. And he's just saying, Christos Vesgresi, Christos Vesgresi, Christos Vesgresi, Christ is risen, Christ is risen. Over and over. Of course, eventually the priest comes and gets him and asked him if he wants to go to confession. A loving priest came to him. And he confesses all of these horrible sins. At the end of it, he says, I didn't commit that one, the one they put me in jail for. It made him mad. He's forgiven. Of course, then later on he goes to a confessor, and the confessor asks him, do you resolve never to commit these sins again? Oh, that that were true, that we would all make such a resolution. He's taken to trial with all the witnesses coming upon him. Of course, he's treated harshly. But all they will say the entire time, every question they ask him, did you do this, is Christos was crazy. With just a radiant face. He's just somewhat of a fool, but a good fool. But at this time, I, didn't remember, I don't remember which emperor, whether it was Nicholas I or which one, was coronated. They released all the prisoners throughout Russia in emancipation at this point when he was coronated. And Wolfman Tom was let go. He began to serve the town day after day after day. He was the man that helped the little old ladies across the street with their groceries and clean things and helped the yard, whatever you needed. 
and everybody came to love him immensely. But one day he disappears in the story. I don't know what happened to him, but they all loved him. Years, years later, a friend that knew him early in life is hunting out in the wilderness as a soldier in Russia. And he sees this hut, and this man radiant, praying. And by the time he gets to him, he's reposed, sitting there, but the angels are descending upon him, basically. In radiance, and recognize it as, as his friend Thomas. His soul's full scratch he missed him. Don't take those words lightly. If they transform this one man, perhaps we're not all Wolfman Toms, but our sins do keep us from God. They do keep us from happiness. They do keep us from true joy. They do keep us from the fullness of life and that life in abundance. And if we let the message of the resurrection this night and, of course, this day take root in our hearts, we can, as Wolfman Tom, become radiant Thomases and serve our neighbor with love, and live the life of the gospel unto the end, and of course be carried up with the angels just as he was. Amen. Amen.